Hey, I want to call up my good friend Anthony Edwards. Anthony, can you come up here real quick? Can we give, up, can we give it up for Anthony? We want to take a second and we want to shout out the dads. Man, we love our dads. We love our dads and I know it's tough in a world, even our culture, to be a dad, to be a man. But today at Bridge Church, we want to say you're doing a great job. We honor you this morning and, and I was praying and the Lord dropped this man on my heart to pray for our dad. So if you a dad, can you just go ahead and stand up real fast? We just want to bless you. I'm going to have Anthony pray for us. Make, hey, can we give it up for our dad, y'all? Look at all these heroes. Look at all of these heroes. I'm so glad. Where my dad at? Oh, I see him. I see him. I can tell by the way he bending over. There he is. That's my pops. Hey, I'm, I'm going to give it up to Anthony. We're going to pray for the dads. If you got something to share, go ahead and do it. Absolutely. No, I love Father's Day. Can we just give a happy Father's Day on the count of three? One, two, three. Happy Father's Day. You know, Mother's Day, we had all the little kids out here and it was beautiful, but this is Father's Day. This is our day. And I just want to ask if you are a man who is not just a biological father, but you have someone in your life who you are fathering, a boy, a girl that you are fathering and being that example, could you also stand, please? Thank you. I love that fatherhood is not an exclusive club, right? It's not just of someone who has had their own child, but someone who has poured into someone else. I think about Jim Poole, who was raised by the men in his community, and that's also fatherhood. So I just want to honor you all today. And there's a scripture that came to mind when, when Rob asked me to share, and that scripture is Psalm 145, verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. And I think about the word father, and I think about just how I want my son and the men that, and the boys that you mentor and father to, to come to know this word father and not flinch when they hear it, but come to know it as loving, as correcting, as disciplining, as, as, as all-encompassing love. And so I just want to pray for everyone here as we celebrate Father's Day. God, thank you for the men in this room. Thank you for the opportunity to steward the lives that you have placed into our circles, into our worlds. God, I ask that you help us, Father, not out of our own strength, yeah. but out of yours. Yeah. That we take your example as daddy, as loving, as correcting, as kind, as slow to anger, yeah. and let that be our, our blueprint for how we cherish and love the lives around us. Yeah. God, the world is in desperate need of fathers right yeah. now. Yeah. It's in desperate need of men to stand in that gap yeah. and show that example and be that love that you need us to be into this world. God, thank you for the opportunity to steward the lives you have given us. And let us just enjoy this day as it reflects who you are as our daddy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And we are going to sing a song. I want to just pray us into this song. I don't know what you came in here with this morning. I have no idea. But what I do know is this. There's a God in heaven who loves you. He loves you so much. There's actually nothing you can do to earn his love. Nothing will stop him from loving you. He's going to continue to pursue you until we get to a place of surrendering. He's not disappointed in you. He's not angry at you. He loves you. And for the next few moments, we are going to invite the ultimate Father, God the Father, to come. We're going to sing songs to him. And I truly believe he's going to do something powerful in the next moment. So, God, we thank you. God, no matter what our relationship is like with our earthly father, you are the ultimate father. So, God, I just pray that you would come. Would you wrap your arms around your sons and daughters? 
Would you let them know that you see them? Would you let them know that you're proud of them? Would you let them know you're not disappointed? Would you let them know that you're for them and not against them? So God, it is our joy to sing praises unto you. So God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that you are the Father that never leaves us nor forsakes us. You are a good, good Father. You love us just the way we are. God, you, 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 you've gone to hell and back for us. And we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being the Father you are. And thank you, Jesus, that we can trust you. Thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. If you believe it, Bridge Church, say, that's what's up. That's what's up. Come on, make some noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, as you're sitting down, make sure you high-five at least three people. Three people. Tell them, that's what's up. That's what's up. How many fathers are, are, are excited for Father's Day? I don't know how you feel out there, you fathers, but Father's Day is uh, quickly becoming like my favorite holiday. I love it. I love waking up in the morning and, and, and the kids are like so excited to, to serve me. I, I, I had my coffee this morning and, and uh, I went and was getting ready and my coffee cup disappeared. And one Joshua said, Dad, is stuff like just disappearing around here? I said, yeah, my coffee cup disappeared. And it's because he wanted to go pour me a fresh, warm cup of coffee and get it ready for me. And breakfast was ready and served, and they had gifts. And I'm telling you what, if you are not a father, you might want to consider becoming a father after you get married. Because Father's Day is off the chain. I, I, I love Love fathers. Any fathers feeling that? Any, any fathers just love Father's Day? It's awesome. It's awesome. The, the, the love we get to experience. I love what Pastor Rob said and talked about uh, our ultimate father. And we're so fortunate. I know Father's Day can be a tough time for people because maybe you've lost a father. Maybe it reminds you of the father you never had. Maybe your relationship with your father was a, a tough one. Well, can I tell you that God is a good, good father? And whatever experience you've had, and, and if today is a tough day, man, he wants to change that for you. Because he wants to let us know how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he would never want anything bad to happen to us. How he's got an incredible plan and, and purpose for every single one of our lives. He's a good father. I'm, 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 I'm still a relatively young father. Any uh, young fathers in the house today? One child, father of one, two, three, four, five. My dad's not here, so I won't get up to 14. I'm a relatively young father. Our, our oldest, Joshua, is eight years old. Joe is six. Juliana is five. She wore a princess outfit just for me today. That's beautiful. That's why I love Father's Day. Jada will be one July 5th. And so I'm a relatively young father. But can I tell you that the longer I'm a father, the more I understand what it means to have a father's heart. And, and, and there's something about becoming a father and being a father that causes you to look at your children. And don't get me wrong, my children mess up a lot. I'm just going to throw it out there. My children need Jesus. A lot. Baptism last week, I was like, man, I can't wait till my kids get baptized. I'm holding them under for an extra second. But, but to, days like today are so good because I get to step back and I just get to look at my kids and I get to watch them serve and, and, and I get to watch them be so excited for their dad and, and I'm filled with so much joy. And even though being a, a father and, and being a mother can be so hard, Man, my, my heart has changed by virtue of having kids. Kids come in all shapes and sizes. 
kids will challenge the heck out of you. When we had my first, our first child, he reminded me a lot of somebody I knew. Me. But he seemed to really highlight and represent those things I didn't like in myself. I was like, man, if that's what having children is like, I don't want any more. But you, you get to see the good, you get to see some of the, the challenges, but my heart has grown in such a way. One day I was looking at my children and, and we like to have a time, a, a family time where we have our kids like stand up and they'll perform and they'll act like their dad and, and they'll get a little stand out and act like they're preaching and try to like do like dad does. For some reason they're like pointing at me, looking at me the whole time when they're preaching too. But they'll, they'll, they'll get up there and they'll act and sometimes, you know, they get up there and they're a little shy. They're like, oh, you know, what's dad going to say? What's mom going to say? And one day I had this revelation as I'm watching them. I'm like, and Jen and I were talking about this. They can stand up and do absolutely nothing. It's actually cuter when they mess up trying to do something. And it was a revelation to me that that's how God looks at us. It's not about what we do. We look good to him no matter what because he just loves us as his children. And he looks at us with such eyes of compassion and grace and, and, and care. And, and I love seeing my children. So God has, has been, been filling my heart, giving me more of, of his heart. And, and I would say more of a father's heart the longer I've been a father. Can I tell you, the same has been true with me and our church. Our church has been around now for uh, 10 years in October. 10 years. And I've been a part at some level of leadership for a little over nine years. And can I tell you that when I first started leading and when I first started preaching, I remember preaching my first message, I was 21 years old. This morning my wife asked uh, my kids some different questions and one of the questions is, how old is daddy? One of my kids said, 22. <laughs> so last year I preached my first message. I'll never forget preaching my first message, and I'll never forget preparing for that, and, and the nerves, and I mean, it was probably like, the, 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 the room was like three rows deep, and I'm, I'm preaching, and I'm prepping, you know, like, it's the greatest game of my career, and I'm getting ready, and, 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 and I just remember afterwards, I was, I was like, man, they didn't get it. They just didn't get it. They weren't laughing at my jokes. They weren't listening. I mean, they just, I thought, I, I thought, I, I just, I could have swore they did not get the message I was trying to share. My dad, you know, afterwards took me aside and shared all the different things that I could do differently. And I realized that it wasn't about them. It was more about me. But I remember prepping for my, my talks in the early years and I would watch communicators and I would try to learn from the best. And my hope was, man, every week I wanted to come and I wanted to, to share something powerful. And, and, and I remember again, based on how people responded and based on how people felt would, would, would for me give me the either validation of how I did. Man, I, I, I wanted to preach so good. Can I tell you, nine years later, doing life with people and watching the ups and downs of life and the challenges and the tragedies and watching people come and go. Can I tell you that God has given me more of a father's heart for our church? And when I see people, I care less about what happens on Sunday morning. And I care so much more about what, what's happening in people's lives. And ultimately, man, I want to see people become the best version of who God has designed them to be. And my heart has hurt over the years as I've watched people come in and out and not for lack of good intentions but for various reasons end up in places that nobody would ever want and I've experienced in my own life but can I just today speak from a father's heart for our church and the Bible talks about how how, how God uh, allows people to father groups of people they're called spiritual fathers. And it's not about a title, but it is about a role that God calls different individuals to play. And one of my primary roles in life, in fathering my children and my family and being a spiritual leader there, is to be a, a spiritual leader among our church. And it hurts my heart. 
when I see people with great intentions live in a way that I know in their heart is not consistent with the, the type of person that they want to be. I love baptism last week. 18, was 18 or 19? 19 people were baptized last week. That's powerful. Come on. That was, our, that was our second baptism of the year. We've had over 40 people baptized just this year right here at Bridge Church. I love it. And baptism, we talked about it last week. It's a celebration of, of new life. I'm telling you, we go, that water, we go under the water, and that water represents our old life, and we're dying to our old life, and when we come back out of that water, it represents the new reality, the new direction, things we're leaving behind. The old is gone, the new has come. We're entering into a new season. I love it. And the Bible talks about baptism and, and how it's that outward expression of an inward work God is doing, a decision that we make. And so when we baptize people, can I tell you, it's one of the most exciting, most celebratory things we do here at Bridge Church. Because we're talking about new life. But today, I want to talk about life after death. Look at the person sitting next to you say, life after death. Look at the other person and say, it's not what you think. I want to talk about life after death, and I'm, I'm not talking about the afterlife after we die physically. I'm talking about the afterlife after we've been baptized, after we've made a decision to follow Christ. How many know there's life after we get baptized? How, how many people know that there is life after I've made a decision to follow Jesus, and I said, Jesus, take my old self. I want to live for you. How many people know there's still challenges? There's still some struggles. There's still some work that has to be done because God has such an incredible calling on our life. And sometimes we talk so much about getting people to a place where they're making a decision, but can I tell you, there is so much more after we make a decision. And even as we had baptism last week, I feel like God just continues to highlight this reality to me that there is life after death. And there are challenges that every single one of us faces. There, the, the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5. If you don't know Paul, at one point in time in the Bible, he was killing Christians. Christian killer. Had this incredible uh, conversion where God gets a hold of his life. He makes a decision to follow Jesus. Starts talking about Jesus everywhere he goes. Ends up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul becomes one of the most incredible spiritual fathers in the Bible. And so in the book of Galatians, Paul is acting as a spiritual father. And he's talking to this, this group of Christians. He's talking to this group of believers, these people who are going to church, these people who represented people who made a decision to follow Jesus. But uh, Paul, as a, a spiritual father to these people, is seeing some things in their life that aren't consistent with the type of life that he knows they should be living. And so Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, Paul says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Somebody say, Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Now, all throughout Scripture, Jesus, when he was here with his disciples, he tells them, hey, I'm about to leave, but when I leave, I'm going to leave you a helper who is going to help walk you through this life. And so Jesus is with his, his, his 12 disciples, and when Jesus was here, he could only influence and impact a certain number of people, but when he leaves, he sends his Holy Spirit. Now, the most incredible thing about that is the Holy Spirit fills anyone and everyone who makes a decision to follow Jesus. And so we see in the book of Acts, the, the, the early believers, it says 3,000 believed in one day. It says they were baptized and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you know that when you make a decision to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts to take resident in your life? If you believe it, say amen. Amen. He takes resident in our life. And so Paul is, is telling, he's reminding, he's sharing. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature 
craves. In other words, these are Christians, these are people who are showing up at church, but he's reminding them, hey, there is still a sin nature. There's the Holy Spirit, but there's also the human spirit. There's the Holy Spirit that God fills us with, but then there's this this human spirit. It says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what our sinful nature nature desires. How many people you experienced when you said yes to following Jesus and he started to fill you up, how many people would say, man, your desires started to change? You started to go after things. You started to want things. I'll never forget when I made that decision in my life to go all in with Jesus, I had a desire to read the Bible in a way I never had before. I could barely get through scripture before I made that decision. I would try But when I said yes to Jesus, he filled me with his spirit, and he gave me a desire to understand his word in a fresh new way. He says your desires are different. But it says these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out our good intentions. But when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation of the law of Moses. Now, again, this is so interesting to me. This is the church, the Galatian church. And Paul's talking to him, and he's saying, I know you're going to church. I know you're showing up. I know you have good intentions. But there's a war that's happening. There's a war that's happening in your mind. There's a war that's happening in your heart. And that war is this tension between our good intentions, God's heart for us, but, man, our human desires. Anybody ever faced or felt that war going on inside of you? It says there's this, there's this struggle that's going back and forth and, and, and back and forth. It reminds me of food. Anybody ever been at war with food? I spent 14 days in the hospital out of, out of, uh, when I was done playing basketball in college. The doctors diagnosed me with ulcerative colitis. Spent 14 days, couldn't eat or drink anything for 12 of those days. I lost about 40 pounds, got out of the hospital, had to take some medicine, started to change my diet. And so I I went on this strict diet for about a year and a half, all uh, paleo diet, all natural, caveman diet, some people call it. And so I did this for about a year and a half. And can I tell you, I never felt better in my life, regained my strength, regained my health. Actually, I think it was partly through this diet, got to a place, I would have to go and get these infusions from this medical center. I would sit in a chair for three hours, they would put an IV in me, and they would pump medication through my body. It's the same type of medication that cancer uh, patients uh, use. So for over a year, I would go there every six weeks for three hours at a time and get this, this drug pumped into my, my, my bloodstream. I started uh, shifting my diet and and after about a little over a year, and, and through prayer, went on a, a fast for a little over 14 days, and I felt like God said that you could get off that, pain, that medicine you were taking. And I'll never forget sitting in the chair one day, and the, the nurse is sitting there plugging me up and pumping this stuff through my IV, and I told her, I said, one day, I'm not coming back here. <laughs> she said, oh, that's funny. She said, oh, you, you'll be back. She said, you know, you can't get off this medication. Because if you get off it, your symptoms will come back stronger and the medicine won't work as well. And I didn't know when or how, but I was just like, man, I think God's going to heal me. It was, you know, those days where you're full of faith. It was just one of those days. She could have caught me on another day. I was like, man, I'm going to be sitting in this chair for the rest of my life. But I was just feeling like full of faith that day. And so I made that declaration out of my mouth. I think I did drive away being like, man, how dumb was that? Why would I even say that to her? Well, can I tell you a year later? I felt like I should stop going back. And so I just stopped. Now, I'm not recommending this, but I just stopped going back. And my symptoms seem to be getting better, and I seem to be doing well, and the doctors are calling me, and the nurses are calling me, telling me, hey, you can't stop. You got to come back. And, 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 And can I tell you, that was 2012 or 2018, and I have been off of all medication and have been healthy ever since. But for that, for that year and a half, I went on this strict diet, and I, I felt better than ever. 
and I was on that diet for a while, and, and, and then can I tell you, as time went on, I started slipping away from that diet. Now, I remember the benefits of being on that diet. I remember how good I felt. I remember how awesome it was. But, but, but over the course of time, I've kind of reverted back to some of my, my old eating habits. And to this day, I got this like war that goes on inside of me when it comes to food. I want to eat healthy. But just like yesterday, my wife goes and buys Oreo cookies because she knows that that's what I want for Father's Day. And I eat like half the, 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 the case of Oreo cookies. There's a war. The Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. He says, why do I do what I don't want to do, but I don't do what I do want to do? He says, there's a war that goes on inside of me. But the Bible says that there's an answer. And so for every single one of us, I'm telling you, there is life after death. And the reality of that life after death is there is this challenge, there is this war. The Holy Spirit desires us to live a certain way, and our sinful, selfish nature desires us to go another way. This is what it says in verse 19. So clear, it says, "When when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Now, as I read these, I just want you to think about your own life. Think about some of your own challenges because it's so amazing how clear these results are. It says sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, arguing, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. I I don't know about you, but when I look at that list, number one, it's exhaustive. Number two, it's so real. And can I tell you that from the time I made that decision when I was in college, And I felt like God said, Josh, either serve me 110% or don't serve me at all. Revelations 3.16 says, either you're hot, you're cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. When I said yes to Jesus, can I tell you that I can go down this list, and I've struggled with almost every single one of these at some level. Can I tell you that in the last year, I have been at war with some of these. When I read these, these descriptions to, in the last week, anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, there are so many words in that list that I resonate with. There's, there, there, there's, there's this war that, that, I, that, that I realize, this tension that's happening inside of me. Uh, John 10.10 10 says that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He would love nothing more than to take us out. And what I recognize, and that this is the thing that I love, is, 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 is the Apostle Paul is talking to this group of Christians, and he's not saying you won't make a bad decision, but he's saying don't let a bad decision turn into a bad lifestyle. Don't, don't, don't let the sinful desire and nature lead you down a path that, 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 that continues to repeat itself and, and you become the person that your sinful nature desires versus the person that God desires. He's not saying we won't struggle with these. He's actually letting us know, hey, there's going to be a war, so we just need to recognize it. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, we are at war. You got to do it with a warlike face. We are at war. And and, and I think it's best if we just acknowledge the fact that, man, we got struggles. We got challenges. There's things that are happening. But it doesn't disqualify us from what God wants to do in and through our lives. That's why we say here all the time at Bridge Church, we're going to celebrate people. No matter where they are, no matter what what they've done, number one, because we're all guilty. Number two... Because bad decisions don't mean you're a bad person. There's actually great hope. 
And that's what I love about this scripture is it, it starts there. And, and the best thing we can do is identify where we are so we can allow God to move us forward. And so verse, verse 22 starts off with but. I always love that because it means something's about to change. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Can I tell you that that is the beautiful power of the God we serve? See, when we follow our sinful nature, it leads to sinful desires and a sinful lifestyle. But when we allow the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to fill us up and, and work inside of us, we get filled with love and joy and peace and patience. And can I tell you, I love the end of that verse. It says there's no law against these. In other words, nobody's going to get mad at you for being more loving. Nobody's going to get mad at you for being more joy-filled. Try it. Just smile at somebody. Nobody's going to get upset for being a little more gentle, a little more patient. The Holy Spirit produces a fruit in us that allows people to see the Jesus in us. Can I tell you that this, the, 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 this message and this word from Paul, one of the spiritual fathers in the faith, is such a message for us today? Because there's life after death. And even for me, just in this last week, you start going through life and, and you get busy. You start trying to do stuff under your own strength and power. You start to get a little more impatient. You start to get a little more easily angered. I mean, all these realities start to happen in my life. And as I stepped back, I felt like, God gave me the word, Josh, you need a reset. You just need a reset. Anybody, if you've got a, a, a phone, a smartphone, how many know that your phone can get a little overloaded? You, you, you can get a lot of uh, different apps on your phone. Your phone starts to slow down a little bit, and sometimes you just need to reset. You just need to reboot your phone. And it's one thing to get a phone, and it's one thing to get it charged up, but how many people know that if you don't keep charging it up, if you don't keep rebooting it, if you don't keep updating it, it's not going to work the way it's designed to work. The same is true in our lives. Luke 11. Luke 11, verse 9. Jesus is telling a story to his disciples. His disciples said, hey, teach us how to pray. And Jesus goes on and tells the story of a man who goes to a house and it's, it's midnight and so he's knocking and, and he says, after a while, if you keep knocking, finally the guy will open up his door. And he says, this is, this is the way I want you to pray. I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. It's a nonstop ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. And then he says at the end, he said, if you sinful people give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Sometimes we just need to be filled up. Sometimes we just need to reboot. Sometimes we just need a, a refresh. I want to invite our worship team up here. I believe that today some of us are here and we need to be refreshed. We, we, we need to be refilled. We, 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 we've been following Jesus. We've been showing up at church. We recognize that there is this war going on. Can I tell you that we cannot win the war on our own? It's not but by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit that we can do anything. And when he fills us up, when we reset, and he, 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 I'll tell you what, there's a freshness, there's an energy, there is a perspective, there's an ability to overcome some of the challenges that we face. I believe that today God wants us to be refilled with his spirit and his presence.
I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. I believe that God wants to fill us up this morning. He wants to leave us. He wants us to leave changed. New vision, new perspective, new reality. But part of it starts with being real with ourselves. Recognizing that, man, I'm at war. I'm at war with myself. There's things that, man, my, my selfish nature wants to do, but, but I know that's not consistent with God's heart for me. Just like a, a father when he sees his, his, his child, his son, daughter, going in a direction that, they, that you know they shouldn't go, and a father runs to that child and says, no, 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 turn this way. Th 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 this is what life looks like. This is what it, how, how you can stay healthy and not get hurt. Can I tell you, as a father does that for his children, God is doing that to us. He's saying, I'm a good father. You just got to let me have my way in your life. Allow me to fill you up with more of my presence. Stop trying to do it on your own and start allowing me to do it in and through you. And I know there's people all across this room that you feel that. Feel that. Man, I need to be filled up. I need to be filled up. The Bible talks about how uh, at times when, when, when leaders were speaking, some people would just start to experience the Holy Spirit. Talked about how sometimes uh, the elders, the leaders would put their hands on people and they would start to experience the Holy Spirit. And it can be experienced in many different ways, but the primary thing is that when we leave, we leave feeling lifted, we leave uh, seeing, having clarity, we leave and we live in a way that reflects the fruits of the Spirit. Ultimately, that's what the Holy Spirit is for, to help us, to guide us, to lead, lead us. And so if you're here today and you would say, man, that's me, I need that, I need that, I need that. I need a fresh, I don't care how long you've been following Jesus. I need that, we need that. Ask, seek, knock, we need it. You can ask at your house, you can ask when you're driving your car, but I'm saying right here, right now, let's not leave without asking and inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us up because we will not be the same. And so if that's you here today, I just wanna invite you to come forward as a sign of God, I need you. As a sign of God, I want you. As a sign of God, I'm willing to step out even when it's a little uncomfortable because I recognize that I need to be filled with more of your presence. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you, Jesus. 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 I need you. Can I tell you, we'll never not need him. Until we're dead, God is not done with our life. We'll never not need more of his spirit in our lives. I need you. I need you telling you, if that's the cry of your heart, I need you. He wants to give us more of himself this morning. I'm just going to pray with us. We've got some leaders, too, that are here that would love to pray together. But I just want us to put our hands out like this this morning as an invitation, as an invitation. And then I just, I, I, I want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. I need your Holy Spirit to fill my life, to fill my heart, to fill my mind. I can't do it on my own strength, but by your Spirit, I can live with power. I can live with authority. I can live with joy. I can be more patient. 
I can live the life you're calling me to. So right now, I invite more of your presence in my life. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up with your presence. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Just start thanking him. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for filling me up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your anointing. Can I tell you, when we ask him, when we invite him, he fills us up every time. He loves nothing more than to do that for his people. I want to encourage us. It's got to be a consistent practice. I told, I told somebody, I said, I probably need to be reset every three months. Probably every three days. Because it's constantly, I start doing my own thing, thinking my own thoughts. But I need God's spirit and power to fill me. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to be dismissed. But I want to invite us, feel free to stay up here. We've got some of our leaders that would love to pray. God wants to fill us with his spirit. There's life after death, so he can use us. God, I thank you that you are a good father, a father who loves us, a father who cares for us, a father who went to the cross for us, and a father who gives us a helper unlike any other helper, a father who gives us his spirit. God, I pray that we would be the type of people that continually allow your spirit to renew our thinking. God, continually allow your spirit to fill us with strength and courage. Would your spirit lead and guide your church today and forever? God, will we be marked by your spirit? Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Rich Church, if we can pray for you after the celebration right now, feel free to come forward. We would love to pray and encourage you this morning and just listen to where you're, to where you're at. I remember this woman spoke, spoke some words over my life, and I know some of us are leaving right now, and that's okay. Can't, looking forward to celebrating again next Sunday. This woman spoke these words over my life as I was going through a war. It was a time of war in my life, and I felt so beat down by my circumstances. And she said to me that she felt like the Father was saying, I won't disqualify you if you don't disqualify you. And I think that's a word that we need to hear this morning. He won't disqualify you if you don't disqualify you this morning. So be encouraged that he's proud of you, he's with you, he loves you, he sees you, he hasn't forgotten you, he still has a plan, he's working all things out for your good this morning. He is the good father. Hug somebody standing next to you this morning, Bridge Church. Hopefully we'll see you at family night this Tuesday, 5 to 8 at Chick-fil-A. We'll be celebrating again next Sunday. We'll do it all again. High five five people before you leave and tell three fathers happy Father's Day.